65, most of the contribution come from atrial contraction. Below the age of 40, 45, most of the contract, most of the volume comes in through early relaxation. Now we know this change in the pressure with the Doppler. We know that we are able to look at the flow characteristic, the blood that is flowing from the left atrium to left ventricle. With the pulse Doppler, we are able to see that. This was first shown by Dr. Kiratabe from Japan 35 years ago. He is the first one to show mitral valve Doppler can be used to assess the LV diastolic function or the properties of diastole. So now let's see how that pans out. So here is a normal LV filling pressure, rapid relaxation due to active relaxation of the unwinding of the apex and the pressure in, uh, comes down. It can even go below zero, negative. Some of us who have done catheter surgery in the past will know that LV pressure, the trough can even go beyond, the wide descent can go beyond the zero line. Then the pressure increases because volume has come, the pressure stable, then until the atrium starts contracting, then the pressure rises, then again isovolume contraction. Corresponding to that, when the ventricle is contracting, atrium is relaxing, so more blood comes in, this is a V wave, so gradually it accum accumulates and reaches the peak. When the ventricle starts relaxing, this pressure is higher, as I suggested, early diastole, rapid decline in the LV pressure, this pressure is higher than that, so the rapidly comes in. Then again, there's the equalization of pressure, then when the atrium is about to contract, it increases the pressure. Now, when you superimpose, you see the curves. This is the early relaxation, suction phase. This is the atrial contraction, pushing phase. This is for most of the younger people. This is for most of the older people. And this is the diastasis. Now, you can imagine if the heart rate increases, this period, diastasis will decrease. So what will happen? During the diastole, early diastole, 70% of the blood will come in. So in a younger people, 35, 40, 45, they're able to exercise, heart rate can go up to 100, 110, nothing will happen because even though it decreases, the most of the volume comes in. Whereas the older people like me, if I heart rate increases, this is already relaxed and decreases more. So this phase comes down. So what will happen is this will decrease further and the atrial contraction increases, LA pressure goes up, we feel short of breath. But on the other hand, even people like us, 60, 65, we can keep this part preserved by day-to-day -day exercise, as well as maintain, making, making sure that your blood pressure is well controlled and you don't have any other comorbidities like sleep apnea, etc. Now, here is the Doppler pressure tracing. This is the normal one, LV comes down, LA rapidly, my, my pressure changes, and then corresponding to that, you see an E wave. Then during diastasis, there is no flow. You can see the diastasis, there is no flow. When the atrium is contracting, there's a flow. So now, with this flow characteristics, you are able to identify the morphology. So most of the things in cardiology, most of us, we develop subconsciously pattern recognition. So you got to recognize what are the patterns. E wave, what does the E wave look like? What does the A wave look like? What is the normal velocity? So here, E wave, normal E wave can be anywhere from 0.8 to 1.2, 1.5 in a very young person. Whereas in an older adult, uh, as you change, as this relaxation decreases, look here. Now, when the relaxation decreases either as a result of aging or as a result of LVH or as a result of disease of the heart, look at that. During early relaxation, this curve is now slower, and as a result, look at this, E velocity is lower, and deceleration time is prolonged, and more blood is left here compared to here, and the A wave is taller. So we use the E wave, deceleration time, EA ratio, to characterize what is a normal filling, what is an abnormal filling, and even in the abnormal filling, is it drastically abnormal or mildly abnormal? So for example, here, 
deceleration time is about 180 to 190, 200. EA ratio is greater than 1.2. So this is essentially normal. Here, deceleration time is prolonged, 320. EA ratio is 0.5. So E wave is about 5.6 and the A wave is 1. So this is about 0.5. So this is the impaired relaxation. Here, we can definitely say the filling pressure has to be normal. Here, we don't know whether the filling pressure is normal or abnormal. It can be changing. And now, this is the advanced stage. Look at here. As the LV relaxation to accommodate the blood gets progressively worse, the LA pressure accommodates. It increases higher and higher and higher. It's like you. When you become a broke, you keep on borrowing, 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 thinking that one day you're going to pay back. Finally, you come to a level where there's nobody to um, uh, the pay off, and the, guy, uh, the guys will come and um, uh, um, uh, foreclose your house and things like that. So this is like a LA is enlarging, enlarging, enlarging to accommodate, to maintain the cardiac output. But in the meantime, nothing has been done, so the LA pressure goes up. So now look at here. Rapid deceleration. This is a restrictive filling, and hardly any flow in the ATM. ATM can't even contract because the ATM has become diseased. So this is the worst part. So from normal to abnormal, looking at the mitral morphology, we are able to recognize what is the disease process that is affecting the heart. So that's the beauty of the Doppler. Now, when you do the Doppler, there are several things you need to know. We all know the heart is not a two-dimensional structure. Heart is a three-dimensional structure. So mitral orifice is a three-dimensional structure. Though all of you who are using color flow, you have known that when you put the color, sometimes the color goes in one direction at the same time, you also see the color going in the other direction. So there will, there will be multiple vertices that is going on within the heart. So when the heart is also relaxing, as I said, apex untwists and base rotates back, so the flow can occur anywhere. So what you have to do is, where do you get the flow? What is the right flow to get the right morphology? That you need to know. For that, what you need to do is, you need to do the basic fundamental, which has been talked by Dr. Yesu Kripa earlier, and also by Dr. Manish Bansal and other, other people, that keep the basic things constant. Keep the frame rate high for Doppler. Keep the sector scan smaller, and keep the color flow Put the color flow and see where is the orange flow that is going in from LA to LV, in what direction it's going. Is my chance to use a parallel to it? So adjust the window. You may have a good apical window, but the heart may be a little bit twisted and the flow may be going towards the lateral wall. Then you may have to move the probe. You may be foreshortening the apex, but you are parallel to the flow. That is very essential. So looking at the flow, color flow gives you a general idea in which direction most of the flow is going. So use that and use the sample volume. For mitral flow, you are interested in looking at the characteristic of the LV relaxation properties. So for that, you need to know when the pressure changes from LA to LV, what happens. So at the tip of the mitral valve, you need to put your pulse volume. And the volume size should be about three to five milliliters. So you can't have it more, then in that case, it takes up the wider area and you, are, you will not be able to discriminate. So preferably about on three millimeters will be better and put it there and keep the filters in such a manner that the low filters are optimized so that you do see what is happening at the lower level. So then what you do is, Optimize your color sector, everything. When the frame rate is high, then use the pulse Doppler. When you are using the pulse Doppler, as I have pointed out, there are several things you are going to measure. One of them is the time. Since you want to measure the time, the error can occur if you are measuring it at 50 millimeter per, uh, per second speed, uh, paper speed. So whenever you want to measure the time, keep at least minimum 100 meters per second. 100 millimeters per second my speed. And similarly, also use the full screen for the Doppler in order to maximize so that you see the profile nicely. 
Otherwise, you have to use a magnifying lens to measure, and the errors can be more. So these are the essential things that I would do in order to get. Now, here is one of the very old studies by Nishimura in 1996, the early days in the cath lab we used to do. Here is the normal LV pressure, normal LA pressure. Look at that. They simultaneously coincide here. There's hardly any flow. So this is the flow that you think E wave, and very little A. So this, mind you, this Michael Doppler features and the cath lab, cath lab pressure difference, if you have made it in 10 millimeters of mercury, then the scale, then we would be seeing it better. Since we wanted to keep it at 150 millimeters, this area is completely squished. This is exactly the reason what I'm trying to say. When you're doing a Doppler, magnify and use as much space as you can without compromising in order to get the good envelope. So here, E and A, deceleration time is 220. E and A wave ratio is greater than 1.2, so it's normal. Now here is a patient, look at the diastolic wave. A wave already starts going up, but it hasn't gone way high up. And here, E wave has come down. A is increased, deceleration, the time is prolonged. So here is the early stage of diastolic dysfunction, or it could be normal for a 70-year-old man who's sedentary and doesn't do much. But look at the mean LA pressure is nine. But the problem here is, if this guy gets up and runs, his pressure is going to go around 9 to 10. When this guy gets up and runs, this pressure can go up to 18 to 20, and he's going to be short of breath. Now, look at this. This progresses. When, the, when it progresses, when the LA, LA accommodates for this pressure, keeps on increasing the volume, increasing the pressure. Look at the LA pressure goes up. When it goes up, look at the E wave morphology. From here, it changes into a pseudo-normal pattern. Now, this looks like a normal pattern, but on the other hand, yet E velocity is increased, deceleration time is short, but yet for normal values, if you look at it, they are normal. So you're going to think that this is a normal profile. Since we don't know the LA pressure here, how do we reconcile that? So here, you can do two things. One, you can ask them to do a valsalva, so by which you decrease the preload, and if this changes to this, then you know that it's got an increased LA pressure. On the other hand, if you have a post-ectopic beat or something like that, which clearly shows like this, then you know that this is pseudo-normalization, okay? So this is with the Doppler alone. Now, when the pressure increases further, look at the baseline diastolic pressure also has gone up. So here is a nine, here is 14. Now it's gone way high up. Now look at this E, and there's all a little bit of a L wave and A wave, EA ratio is greater than two, and deceleration is not quite short, but getting short. So this is going into a restrictive filling. So the Doppler profile, what we see, and the Doppler measurement do correspond with the hemodynamic measurement. That's the reason no longer hemodynamic measurements are made to assess the diastolic function, unless otherwise there's a disparity. Now, here is the patient where this is, I've asked Ranjit to distribute to all of you uh, the guidelines by Dr. Nage and also the presentation what I'm making, a PDF I've given. So you can look into these things or, which is there. Here is a E and A wave. As you can see here, E is about 0.8, A is 0.6. So EA ratio is normal and deceleration is short. Now, when you do a Valsalva, look at that, it decreases significantly. This tells you that the patient has got elevated filling pressure. So this is simple at the bedside that you can do. Look at also the picture here, how well they've optimized the screen, use the screen in order to see the, uh, see the, um, uh, the, the, the Doppler profile. Now, here is another one. You see a pattern like this. This looks like a pseudo pattern like a, um, a grade one, diastolic, uh, grade one diastolic dysfunction. E is smaller, A is larger, but E wave velocity is almost 1.3. Then you should wonder, E is 1.3, but E is short. Why is this? You need to pay attention for heart rate and PR interval. So here the same one, when the heart rate is decreased from 82 to 65, look at this, it's normal. So when you have this, 
you need to look at where E and A are joining. If it's going to be greater than 0.5, that needs to be subtracted from here in order to measure the EA ratio. So these are all the subtle things, but you don't have to worry. But here, the other thing what you can do here is auscultate the carotid, and if there are no brewy, just do a um, uh, carotid sinus massage, the heart rate will slow down. Or ask the patient to take a gentle breath and hold it for a few seconds, the heart rate will slow down. Then you will change the pattern from here to here. Then you know this is a normal velocity. Okay, some of these things got to now. Now, this clearly shows, look at the importance. This is one of the older studies, which Dr. Chang was known for his EKG. Clearly, when the heart rate increases, E and A is essentially normal. Heart rate increases from 72 to 88. A comes in earlier. They merge together. Then when the heart rate is 110, they merge much more quicker. But the reality is, when it is merging together, that atrial contribution doesn't contribute anything to LV at all. It basically is exactly the same volume that it is getting. In fact, it is losing the atrial contribution. So this clearly points out to you that in patients who are short of breath or heart rate is high, even though it may appear like a normal diastology, pay attention to EA ratio, pay attention to A wave, and these are the people who might bet better off by being on a beta blocker to prolong a little bit of the, um, um, uh, slow down the heart rate. Now, these are the normal velocities according to all age group, 40 to 70. So in a person who is about 70 years old, sedentary, it can be 0.4 to 0.5. In a young person who is around 40, 45, it can be 1.2 to 1.5. Similarly, A wave can be, in a normal person, can be 0.3. In an elderly person, it can be 1.2. EA ratio also, in a normal person, it should be around 1 to 1.5. But with the aging, it decreases. With the heart failure, it increases. On the other hand, all these things are subjected to whether you have, so you can't just use Doppler alone. You got to use it in conjunction with the echocardiographic morphology of the LV, morphology of the LA, as well as the volume status, blood pressure, posture, heart rate, everything. So as I pointed out to you, one important thing is never do a Doppler without a proper ECG because the morphology is what you have seen E and A wave are based upon diastole and atrial contraction when you see the e, uh, ECG. When you don't have an ECG, if there's an ectopic or if there's a changes in that, how would you interpret? You can't. So try to get a, make it as a habit to do a routine good ECG before you start doing a Doppler. Now, now in mid 90s, we started looking at the tissue Doppler. So what, is, what does it mean? When you do a Doppler, Pulse wave where the series of ultrasound is sent in, but unlike the echocardiogram where it is perpendicular, this is parallel. So it reverberates from the red blood cell as well as the tissues in line with it. We suppress the velocity from the tissue, which are low velocity, and enhance the, the blood cell velocity, which are higher. So that's how we get our normal Doppler, either CW or a pulse wave. Now, on the reverse, when you suppress the higher velocities, then magnify the lower velocities from the tissues, you're able to see some interesting features. The mitral annulus, when it is coming back after ringing back, it is jumping back to the previous position, there is a higher velocity, E velocity. Then when the atrium is contracting and pushed and come back, comes back up, you see a A velocity. Similarly, during systole, you see another velocity. So we're able to see these things. Now, Dr. Sean and Dr. Hartley, for, as well as our group, and Dr. Nage from Methodist with Dr. Kinoanas, we all started looking at this, what are these characteristics? And finally, we came up with the idea that in a normal person, when the ventricle is relaxing, which is like a suction, this is like a spring, when you pull the spring and leave it, it rebounds back. So E velocity is normal. And E velocity contribution, as I said, in a normal person is very little, so A should be lower.
the ear should be taller, the septal size should be greater than at least 7 to 8 centimeters per second, and ear size it should be greater than 0.5 to 0.6 centimeters per second. With the aging, that early relaxation bounce is not there, so the ear velocity goes down. Now the atrium is pushing it, as I pointed out, so ear velocity goes up. Oh, okay, this is normal, and this is grade one, early relaxation abnormal, that's what they thought. Then when it's becoming pseudo-normal, this air also getting down because the left atrium is failing and is not able to accommodate, so both E and A are decreasing. So that can be seen in pseudo-normal as well as in restriction. So based on this, they thought that, well, you can combine the microflow with the tissue Doppler, then we can assess the diastolic little bit more better. So that's what led to the coming up of the, so now before the, I show that, I'll show you the velocities. Again, this is from the normal volunteers, 40 to 70 years. Septal velocity normally in a young person, it'll be on the higher level. In an older person, it'll be on the lower level. A velocity in an older person is going to be higher, and a younger person is going to be lower. So same way. E and septal and lateral. This is very important. When you are looking at the tissue Doppler, again the same principle applies. You need to give the sector scan short to increase the frame rate and also put the tissue Doppler. Nowadays most of the machines have got increased frame rate so you can tolerate. Then use, since it's a lower tissue velocity, the sample volume should be at least five to seven millimeters. Septal is in line with the apical four chamber view. So it is par quite parallel. So the septal velocities are quite, quite normal. But as lateral, you have to move if the heart is enlarged or the heart is positioned wrongly, you need to move it so that lateral annulus is parallel to your beam before you get it. So typically lateral velocity are higher than the medial velocity. So EE ratio in a normal person when you take it, septal varies from 4.6 to 6.6 .6 is the age according to different age group. And lateral is much lower. Again, the same practice, LVH, if you have a septal infarct, don't take the septal leaf of a septal area, use the lateral. So that's the reason the guideline says that you average septal E and lateral E, and that average should be used for the ratio from between E to E, my E to E prime ratio. So again, hypertension. Most of you I've seen here, unfortunately, blood pressure is not recorded. ECG is not there. I know that all of you have a lot of volume, quickly you're doing a screening. But if the patient has got shortness of breath, if the LV function looks normal and the valve looks okay, then you are impend you, you have to look at the diastology. For that, you need to know the blood pressure. You also need to know the, uh, the heart, the, the, what is the ECG characteristic. So make sure that you measure the blood pressure. Make sure that you have the proper ECG. Because all of them varies from uh, all these parameters. So here, with that, combining that, this is Dr. O and Little when they wrote that review. Clearly you can see the normal E, normal A, proper deceleration, and the normal tissue. So when you see this, you can rest assured, you don't have to worry whether the patient has got diastolic dysfunction or not. The heart, heart feeling characteristics are normal. You really can't have anything else, no matter what the patient may have in terms of uh, um, uh, disease. This indicates normal diastolic function. On the other hand, if the E is low, deceleration time is prolonged, A is taller, and E prime is low and A prime is increased, this tells you, well, early diastole is impaired, there's a problem, this could be, you have a chance of correcting it, either ischemia or hypertension or any other thing, you can look into that to reverse this. Or sometimes drugs can also cause, you can do that. And similarly, when you see, Similarly, when you see a normal pattern, but EA ratio is slightly higher, deceleration time is either normal or within normal limits are getting shorter, but E prime is low. 
then you should wonder, well, with this I should see a normal E prime, but E prime is low. And then you average E prime, still it is low. Then if it is lateral less than 10, septal less than 5, or abnormal, if it is abnormal, then you should think, am I dealing with a pseudo-normal pattern? So this is pseudo-normal. Then when E wave, A wave becomes diminutive, EA ratio becomes greater than 2, 2.53, deceleration becomes shorter, and both E and A are small, then you know clear, clearly that you are in a restrictive phase. So these are the patients who are going to be having symptomatic, you don't even have to worry about the outpatient because they will be symptomatic. So based on this, we are able to characterize the diastolic property of the heart. Now, the question is, the guidelines which was written in 2009 and subsequently revised in 2016 by Nage and other people, it expects only few things for all of you to be a good diastolic parameter analyzer. One, get a good mitral inflow. One to three millimeter sample volume at the tip of the leaflet, focus on the color flow, orange color, where it's coming, get it, E and A. Then E velocity, A velocity, EA ratio, and deceleration time. Then get the mitral tissue annular velocity, septal as well as lateral, and E prime ratio, both of them, uh, your average. Then, in spite of these two, in order to assess the filling pressure, you need to know a few other things. Is the patient has got tricuspid regurgitation? Is it in the beyond the physiological the, uh, territory? So you need to know that. Second, you also need to know that the organ that is bearing the brunt of this grossly um, neglected diastology is left atrium. So is the left atrium is enlarged, or what is the left atrial volume? So they expect all these three. If you have these four parameters, mitral, tissue doppler, TR, and left atrial volume, you can assess the filling pressure. So initially I showed you mitral doppler and the tissue annular doppler allows you to characterize the types of diastolic function. Now, here you're going to see the filling pressures. So here they come out with this, where it says, if the average E, e prime ratio is greater than 14, then it is abnormal. If the septal E prime is less than seven, it is abnormal. If the lateral one, E prime, is greater than 10, is abnormal. And TR velocity greater than two point, I mean, uh, my lateral E velocity less than 10 is abnormal. It should be greater than 10. Less than 10 is abnormal. The TR velocity is greater than 2.8, it is abnormal. Then LA volume greater than 34 ml per meter square. This is another reason when the patients come, I know that all of us here in India, you, you put through a, it's like a, it's like a uh, going to a, a market, like a coin bird market here. People go through like a cola. You have to have a, their weight and height measured at least once when they come into the clinic. Whoever was doing it when the patient enters the clinic, hospital or clinic, they should measure that because you need to correct the size to the body surface area. Otherwise, you won't know how to interpret, how to com compare it with the normative data. So LA volume index greater than 34 ml per meter square is abnormal. So if you have three out of these four are abnormal, then you have a diastolic dysfunction. If three out of these four is normal, then you have a normal diastolic function. In between, if you have only one, you are indeterminate. So what do you do there? That's where I, you use, that's where I showed you, I think I'll show you here, I think it's gonna be, ah, that's where you need to look at pulmonary vein Doppler, whether the systolic flow is dominant than the diastolic, then it means that LA pressure is normal, LV pressure is normal. On the other hand, if the diastolic is dominant and systolic, then you know that LA pressure is increased. And similarly, look at the A wave duration of the mitral inflow. For this, 
you need to measure the airway at the annulus, like how you are going to measure for the quantitation. That's why you have to measure not at the tip, at the annulus, and compare that with the airway here. If the duration of the airway here is greater than 30 to 40 milliseconds more than this, that indicates elevated filling pressure. Then, so when you don't have a, when it's only one is abnormal, then you need to use the other, other parameters. Now with this, they also recommend getting the lateral and septal E prime and averaging it. Normally the septal E prime is going to be around eight to 10. Lateral one can be anywhere, anywhere from 12 to 15, 16. So averaging this is better than taking one. If the patient's got a lateral wall in fog, a lateral wall is not moving, then don't take this. You're going to be falsely averaging something where there's nothing, nothing is going to be there, then use a septal. So use your discretion based upon the presence or absence of regional wall motion. Now, when they did that, assessing the filling pressure, how do they compare with the grading? When you have a normal mitral pattern, normal E wave, normal A wave, normal deceleration, and the E prime is normal, then LA volume is also normal, TR velocity is going to be normal, and your filling pressure is going to be essentially normal. Similarly, in grade one, E velocity may be low, A velocity may be increased, EA ratio is less, less than 0.8 and E ratio is still less than 10. So here also the PA RB for systolic pressure is going to be essentially normal, unless otherwise the patient has got inherent pulmonary disease or some other disease not related to left heart. So then LV filling pressure is going to be normal and LA is also going to be normal. So in these patients, you can use the LA. LA is a good marker. Whereas anybody who's got a pseudo normal or restrictive, the minute you see the LA itself, you can think, they're going to have an increased filling pressure. And if the EE prime ratio is greater than 14, then definitely they do have. So one can use these things to compare the filling pressure. Now, in patients with LV dysfunction, or patients who have got a normal LV function, but they do have myocardial disease, like they have, uh, what do you call it as, infiltrative disease like amyloid or LVH, or they have uncontrolled diabetes, which all affect the myocardial properties, then in them, even though your LV function may be normal, you may need to use a different flow diagram. There, they want you to look at absolute E velocity. If the absolute E velocity is less than 0.5 centimeters, which normally you would expect in a patient with a LV dysfunction as well as stiff ventricle and not quite stiff, but thick ventricle, you would expect the E velocity to be less than one. So if it's going to be less than 0.5, but EA ratio is less than 0.8, then you can rest assured that they have a normal LA pressure. On the other hand, if the EA ratio in that population is greater than two, there's no question. Early filling velocity, PA, uh, LA pressure is gone up. That's the reason EA is taller. So in, this, in those patients, LV, LA pressure is increased. But in between, you have to look at the E prime ratio. Is it greater than 14, TR velocity, and LA volume? If two of the three are positive, then again, they become increased LA pressure. If two of the three are negative, then normal. Then in between, again, as I showed you, you have to use other methods, like pulmonary vein and isovolumic relaxation time, which has become shorter with the increasing filling pressure. And also look at here, what do you see here? PR interval, restrictive filling, and diastolic MR. When you see these kind of features, you really don't need to have other features to say that the filling pressure is increased. So one has to take consideration of all these things. Now, I talked about the value of LA volume. LA volume has to be measured, basically in a biplane method. So at the end, Systole, when the LA is bigger, it says it in the four chamber view uh, and, and uh, get the area as well as length. Then two chamber view the same way. In this patient, the picture you can see there's a basal inferior aneurysm here, nicely seen. The same area and length. So now 
you all of you know the formula 0.85 times area one area two divided by length shortest length not the longest shortest length then it gives you the area volume then divide that by body surface area you get the volume index this becomes very important i'm sure that none of you are going to see the video as good as i see it because of the lag that involves but nevertheless here is a patient with lv on the left side rv here la is big and you see the lvh and systolic function is normal but the la is dilated so in this patient la volume biplane volume was 30.8 ml so which is 34 is a cutoff is 30.8 not bad it is, it is getting there but it's okay LA volume, why do we have to measure irrespective of the diastolic function? So this is the original work long, long time ago. My good friend and my mentor, Dr. Seward, he was the one, actually, none of you will have LA volume. In fact, 1988, 89, he was trying to tell Dr. Sajik that we need to measure the LA volume. Sajik was saying that, no, 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 it's a crazy idea. But Seward persisted with it, and we have shown that everything correlates with the LA volume because the LV is dysfunctional either because of artic stenosis, either because of coronary artery disease, either because of myopathy or myopericarditis, doesn't matter. The brunt is borne by the LA. So LA keeps on dilating to accommodate initially. So when the LA dilates, after some time, LA pressure can't keep up. So you're going to develop heart failure. Same way you're going to develop LV, atrial fibrillation, all the comorbidities. Here, Dr. Theresa Sang clearly shown that people who have got the LA volume greater than 37 ml per meter square, their chances of developing, um, not having to have a admission of a heart failure, significantly less. But 40% of them will develop heart failure within a period of eight to nine years. If the LA volume is less, then only five to 10% of them will develop. So this is important. So even when you're doing a patient, when you see the LA volume, then the physician should take that matter and see what are the things that I can correct in this patient. Can I correct the blood pressure? Can I correct his diabetes? Can I make him get exercise and do things? Are his medications optimized properly? Does he have obstructive sleep apnea? Things that he can do to mitigate the afterload mismatch that will improve. Now, the same way we got the E, e and E prime and Dr. Oman, when he was a fellow with us, he asked the question, how are you going to show, show that this is what it is? Then Nishimura, as usual, wants to prove it by catheterization. So when all the patients who had a echo Doppler and they did a cat, they found out that when the EE prime ratio, we used only septal, EE prime ratio was greater than 15. Majority of them had a filling pressure greater than 15. Same thing was shown by Dr. Nage also. So that's the reason E prime ratio greater than 14 is used as a cutoff value now. So this is in all comers, especially normal LV function. And this is repeated after several years later by Dr. Rizma et al. They have shown that the same E prime ratio cutoff point greater than 14 on the E prime average, medial and lateral, when they use it in heart failure patients, patients with LV dysfunction, low EF, the cutoff value is pretty good. E prime ratio was able to predict who has got an elevated filling pressure. So that shows you the value, powerful value of non-invasive parameter when it's obtained properly can tell you what to do with the patient. Similarly, the deceleration, simple deceleration time of the mitral valve in a patient with heart failure, if it is less than 125, the outcome is bad. If it is greater than 125, it's not as bad as the other one. So here, you have a lot of room to mitigate and to op optimize the medication, preload, afterload, all of them, try to change them from here to here. Now, I think, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure, Ranjit, what's the time now? I'm going to go over some illustrative cases uh, to go over, is all of you are um, uh, able to hear better? Yes, yeah, sir, I think the audio is very good and you can continue um for as long as you wish no i think i'll show for three or four cases then we can leave it for open then afterwards yeah. if they want okay yes for sure okay well this is a case i've taken from dr nage because 
you, you guys are going to get there. One thing I learned from Dr. Kripa was when he took the thing from the guideline, it's easy for you to access the guideline and you can also look at it to reinforce. If I show my own cases, you may not be able to solve, but I've given you my cases also along with the handout and also cases from the guidelines so that guidelines will also be, you'll be getting it from Ranjit so you can look at it later on and reinforce yourself. Here is a normal patient with a LV is normal, LV function is normal, EF is 60%, LA volume is 24 ml. Basically this person, since the LA volume is normal and EF is normal, the likelihood of this patient having diastolic dysfunction is going to be practically zero, but can have. But if you look at them in them, if the E wave is normal 0.8 and A wave is normal 0.5, EA ratio is also normal 0.1.6, then you're rest assured that this is going to be normal. But in order to be confirmatory, if you do an E prime, which is also 12 centimeters, and the E prime ratio is 6.6, .6, then obviously this patient cannot have an elevated filling pressure at all. So this clearly points out that the powerful message, the LV function, LA volume, and these two parameters can tell you. Now, this is another patient, obviously LVH. You can also see a systolic motion of the anti-mitral leaflet. So it's a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. LVH, EF of 70%. And look at the E wave, it's like a pseudo normal I pointed out, E is 1.3, A is 0.7, EA ratio is 1.8, EA ratio is normal, these velocities by themselves are normal. But look at the, in this case, if you look at it alone, if you don't do the tissue Doppler, if you look at this alone, you're going to say LV function is normal, the LVH is there, and LA volume, we didn't measure it, so it's okay, so it's going to be normal. But if you look at the E prime ratio, E E prime on the septal is low, four, it should be greater than seven. It is low, less than seven is abnormal. Similarly, lateral, it should be greater than 10. It is less than 10, here's four, six, it's abnormal. When you use E prime ratio, it is 26. Needless to say, in this patient, TR velocity is also high. So this shows the value that you can't use one or the other. It has to be done in a proper manner, proper way. So this puts it, this patient to grade two, or pseudo normal pattern with the elevated filling pressure. So if you look at that case I showed you, this corresponds to this. First case corresponds to this. Now this is another one, one of the colleagues of Dr. Nage and from his own lab, Anderson. So here's a patient who's got a basically LV dysfunction, left atrial volume is increased 61, and EF is 30%. Okay, in this case, if you look at the E is normal, A is also normal, EA ratio, however, is greater than 3.2, A is diminutive, I'm sorry, it's not normal, it's quite diminutive, and deceleration is sharp. So this puts it under a restrictive filling. So clearly, LV dysfunction, EA ratio greater than two, it indicates that there's elevated filling pressure already we, we know. But if you want to get it better, look at the annular velocity, okay, extremely low. So 3.9. So when you use the E ratio is 21. So now needless to say, this patient also has got a elevated RV systolic pressure, secondary to chronic elevated left atrial diastolic dysfunction, left atrial pressure. So this tells you how each one of them complements and helps you out. And in this patient, when they did a cath, they showed the wedge pressure of 27 millimeters, prominent V waves, mean wedge pressure is about 27. So this is another one. When you look at this pattern, I told you to recognize the pattern recognition, but the pattern recognition can sometimes be misleading. So you have to be sometimes careful. Here you look at it, wait a minute. The E wave, EA is like a pseudo grade one diastolic dysfunction but the deceleration is not completely uh, slow, it's prolonged. And E wave is also greater than 0.5, it's not less than 0.5, and EA ratio is going to be basically, A wave is 1.2, so EA ratio is going to be less than 0.6. So this is 0.8, um, so this point skew probably the filling pressure should be normal. But on the other hand, you look at the E prime, 
E prime gives you the value that it is basically about five. So this is around 75 millimeters. Okay, in the, in the, it's about 70, 75 centimeters. So E E ratio is going to be, E A ratio is about 0.7. E E prime ratio is 15 centimeters. So this is normal. This is now only abnormal here. It is it is not less than 0.5. It's greater than 0.5. And E A ratio is less than 0.8. That is normal. Whereas this is abnormal, and this is also abnormal, greater than 14. So you see, only one out of the three are positive. Now, TR velocity doesn't help us out here. Your guy is incomplete. But look at the LA volume, it's increased. So now, three of the two are positive. This is abnormal. This by itself is abnormal. And this is enlarged. So now you can clearly say this patient's got an elevated filling pressure, even though this morphology is misleading. And look at the pressure here, V wave. Best pressure is 25, large V waves. So, and this is another 40-year-old gentleman who has got normal E, normal A. And look at the septal E prime, extremely low. Lateral is normal. So now this patient had a septal infarct. So if you use this, you're going to be falsely saying that he's got an elevated filling pressure. On the other hand, here you need to use the normal one. So normal one when used, 10, 12, and 120 E ratio is only E E E prime ratio is only 10, which is normal. So here, if you look at the diastolic function, is basically normal diastolic function. LV filling pressure basically normal. So here is the E A ratio is 2, septal E is 0.6, and E ratio Acceptably, when you use it, it's 20, but laterally, when you use it, only 9. So this is the correct, correct way to look at it. This is a patient from Dr. O. Normal LV size, normal LV function. You have a region of almost abnormality. Okay, here is your TR, which is normal. Look at the mitral lymph flow, E and A, almost similar. So you about around 1. And deceleration time is normal, 180 millisecond. E prime is quite normal, it's about seven to eight um, on the septal side, eight, which is normal. So LV filling pressure is essentially normal. I think when you're using the LV, this is another case from Dr. O which clearly points out that patient with the amyloid, normal LV size, normal LV function, so E and A may be normal. E velocity is 0.85 and A velocity is about 1.2. E A ratio is 0.8. Whereas E prime is extremely low. So it gives you an E prime ratio of only 10. TR velocity is also normal. Even though they have a myocardial disease, their pulling pressure is essentially normal. But this patient, you have to be careful if they're going to go for a bone marrow transplantation, if they're going to be going for any other testing, they can't tolerate the volume. They may, even though it is normal, the minute you give the volume, it's going to go up, and this is going to, E velocity is going to increase, and you're going to go into heart failure. So this is how you can use these data. I think I will stop with this and take questions, uh, Ranjit. Hello? Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful session. Uh, I will now invite Ashok to moderate the question and answers. So he'll read out the questions from the chat window and you can answer soon. Okay. Ashok. So, uh, thank you for an uh, uh, excellent presentation as, as usual and uh, it's a very detailed one. Uh, shall I read out the questions for you, sir, from the chat box? Please, please, please. So till you find out, Ashok, I'll read the first question. Yeah. The first question from Dr. Vinod Vision is role of spectral tracking or global long longitudinal strain in di diastolic That's dysfunction? Good. Well, I think it is helpful because even though, I, as I pointed out to you earlier, even though the LV morphologically may be normal, early stages of LVA, early stages of infiltration, the spectral tracking strain will tell you myopathic process 
but nevertheless the filling pressure it doesn't tell you anything about the filling pressure so you really have to use the e e prime ratio to get the filling pressure so it helps you to identify those patients for management well wait a minute i am having a patient with aortic stenosis the filling pressure is normal whereas the strain instead of being minus 19 to minus 20 is minus 15. so last time when i saw him is about minus 18 so this is a time, even though he doesn't have symptoms, uh, I may need to interfere, intervene with, with him. On the other hand, if I don't, he may be the one who is going to develop heart failure quickly. So that's the way it will help, but I don't think it's going to help you in management. Whereas LA strain will be able to help you. If you do the LA strain, if the LA strain, the study, there is not quite a number of studies are done on that, but none of them are conclusive. That's the reason the guidelines doesn't give anything on the LA strain, how to use it. But the reality is LA strain, more than LA strain, LA booster pump, LA maximum volume at the end systole and the minimum volume after the atrial contraction. So the ratio of that will give you additional information. Who will be going on to develop heart failure and who is going to develop exercise induced intolerance. So that will be much more important than the LA strain itself also. Okay. Next okay, question. Uh, next question, uh, the speckle tracking in the fetal echo. Speckle tracking in fetal echo, Dr. Singh gave a talk. Uh, to be honest with you, I do fetal echo, but not as a routine. I do it on a special occasion for special people for looking at anatomy, anatomy anatomical defects but I don't do it regularly, so I really can't comment. And Dr. Ben Idem, a colleague of mine, and Dr. Um, the Sabalka um, from Mayo Clinic, they have done, and both in normals and other, uh, in congenital heart disease patients, as my memory serves, basically the speckle tracking strain rate on the normal heart is no different than a normal person. It may be a little bit higher, minus 20 to 25 um, uh, strain rate on the left side. On the right side may be still the same, but not as much as the left side. But I'm, uh, I can't, you can't hold me for that, okay? But I don't, I don't know whether they have published it. I don't think they have published it yet. Any other questions? Okay, sir. So uh, one message, uh, question from Dr. Harshavadan Bora. So when to use Valsalva for determination of grade of diastolic dysfunction or a pseudonormal pattern for, uh, of uh, MV inflow? Well, Dr. Bora, that's great. Thank you. Well, I think, I think when you look at the mitral inflow, it looks E wave is increased, EA ratio is greater than 1.5, getting to 2. Then you realize that E prime is on the border zone 0.6.8 and you know that it's going to be grade 2. There you may have a normal filling pressure, you may not have normal filling pressure. There well, Valsalva will do the justice. If you do Valsalva, if the reduction is greater than 0.5 and reverses significantly, uh, then I think you know that you have a very filling pressure. On the other hand, if the Valsalva brings both E and A wave completely down, then it is a normal filling pressure. So you, it avoids you from unnecessarily treating somebody with a diuretic, or it, it allows you to start implementing diuretic on a patient who deserves it. So that's the way it, will, it should be used. Simple thing you can also do in those patients are, if you're capable of doing echo Doppler, just asking them to uh, lie down, and lift their feet for three to five minutes and then do the Doppler. If the E velocity goes up and deceleration comes down, that also indicates that filling pressures are elevated. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, the other question is from Dr. Pradeep Reddy. How to measure accurate atrial strain on diastolic dysfunction? Atrial strain on diastolic dysfunction. Well, Dr. Reddy, if you can find out the method, let me know. The, the, the reason is, number one, 
in order to image the left atrium, you need to, in a normal person, let's say that you are a younger person, normal person, if you're going to be looking at the LV from four chamber, you're foreshortening the left atrium. If you want to get the left atrium, you need to foreshorten the LV. Uh, that's the only way you're going to get a complete comprehensive view of the LV in my LA. So now in adult patients, when the LA is enlarged, then you have to make sure that you all the data what we have is currently using the uh, biplane volumetric data for volume. Whereas when the strain comes, we're using only a monoplane, two, um, a two dimensional four chamber view we are using. So there also the septum and the lateral wall where the pulmonary vein anchoring, we all don't know. And the thickness of the atrium is also such that it doesn't lend ourselves to a, to a error without um, making measurements which are robust. So that's the reason we are having, all of us are having trouble. But yet, people are doing it and putting a smaller region of interest and trying to look at it, they're coming up with that. But personally speaking, we did these things in 1995 to 2000, 2002, but I don't think that uh, um, I concentrate on booster function, which uh, is much easier and less error prone. More people can do it easily. Thank you, sir. Yeah, the I question think is from Dr. Gautam Sharma. How correctly you do Valsalva in your echo patients? Well, the best way to do Valsalva is not to assess, assess Valsalva. When you do a Valsalva maneuver, what happens? You increase your vagal tone also. So your heart rate has to decrease. So the best way will be is ask the patient to put their thumb in the mouth and ask them to blow it without opening that, try to give that strain. So normally one expects that that will create a, a pressure of 40 millimeters negative pressure, positive pressure, that's what they, they think. Uh, when people have done the superficial manometry and the pressure, that's what it did. So that should be able to do the same amount. But I think the best way will be is, first ask the patient to practice a few times, not just on the table tell them, Put your finger in and you blow it. Now you can't. Ask them to, you, you show it to them first and ask them to practice and then do it and they'll be able to do it. Next, Ashok. Yes, sir. How to find LA pressure, filling pressure by echo? Well, there are two ways. I think the, 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 the way which I my, showed you right now, there are formulas also are there. I, E prime ratio plus four. So one can use all those kind of formulas, but the LA pressure assessment starts off with measuring your E velocity, EA ratio, and E prime on that ratio, and looking at the LA volume. So all these things. So it's a, it's a comprehensive assessment. Still, still, you can only say LA pressure is elevated LA pressure is normal. You can't say the elevation is mild, moderate, or severe. That only you can say based upon the morphology of the mitral inflow. So it, uh, the, the, in order to get that, you have to, so in a normal patient with a normal LV function, all you have to do is E, E prime ratio, septal E prime, as well as the E, E prime, average E prime ratio, and the LA volume. If, and, the, and the TR, if three of the four are positive, then you have elevated filling pressure. If three of the four are negative, you have normal filling pressure. Whereas in the case of people who have a depressed LV function or structurally diseased heart, then you need to use EA ratio. Look at the absolute velocity for the E. If it is less than 0.5 and EA ratio is less than 0.8, then you're going to have a normal filling pressure. You can't have anything other than that. If the EA ratio is greater than two, obviously you have increased filling pressure. So then A duration on the pulmonary, pulmonary Doppler, and EE prime ratio, all of them you can use. Okay, next. Thank you, sir. Uh, how to interpret GD3 uh, pattern in young children and athletes? How to interpret what? Can you read it again? 
how to interpret gd3 uh, pattern in young children and athletics oh great three pattern well i think the the great three pattern what you're going to be seeing now you're not going to see a great three pattern in a younger all you're going to see in a young person is ventricle is so normal it's going to be sucking the blood so your e velocity will be high and deceleration can even be around 140 150 sure and a velocity may be extremely low also but your e prime is going to be normal e prime also should be around on the medial septal side it should be around 10 11 on the lateral side it should be around 15 20 so use the e prime don't ignore the e prime and also look at the la volume all of them should have a normal la volume unless otherwise they are runners on um, chronic um, uh, athletic people where the la volume can be increased but e prime should be normal okay sir so uh, how we differentiate between normal and grade 2 diastolic dysfunctions normal and grade 2 which is basically pseudo normal that's where i said valsalva and e prime morphology septal and lateral e prime ratio and you can also do the other clues where pulmonary veins and those things you can do i think the key important thing there is going to be is absolutely valsalva this is dr bora asked the same question do a valsalva maneuver and look at the e prime morphology both of them are be good so when you do a e prime make sure that if there's a, there is going to be oscillation sometimes it may be 0.4 sometimes it's going to be 0.5 sometimes it's going to be 0.6 average three consecutive ones don't take the first take the intense signal so for that image optimization compress and gain become very important okay okay so thank you sir and uh, another question from dr gautam sharma do you regularly use beta blockers in patients with uh, fusion of e and a waves to assess diastolic dysfunction no 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 i think dr sharma i think you you no i'm i'm trying to tell you can't use the beta blockers to assess the function no you can do that very easily at the bedside by carotid sinus massage if there is no bruise or by doing little bit of a you have genuine holding the breath for some a few minutes um, to, a, to a level where they becoming straining then the heart rate will slow down you don't if you give a beta blocker to slow down the heart rate you may have to wait for a long time so now that is therapeutic effect and uh, for example somebody who has got a heart failure uh, symptoms and then ea is compliant superimposed and uh, and i know that this is what it is then you can start them on that and repeat uh, if the other indications are also appropriate then reevaluate them when the heart rate is prolonged there you don't even need to do that you can just do the ecg that will tell you what the tp interval so tp interval which is short before now it will be prolonged so then uh, that should tell you that the patient should be feeling better so that's how i would use i won't use the beta blocker to slow down the only area where the beta blocker is being used slow slow down in the ct scan areas nowadays Okay. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, the other question is uh, from Dr. Sanjeevni. Uh, there is a small group uh, with grade one with E by E prime greater than fourteen, with raised LA pressure. Uh, please talk on this. Well, I think uh, in those patients you would use other measures. Number one is the if the average E E prime, average septal and lateral E prime E prime along with the E, if it is going to be greater than five, then you have uh, your e velocity can't be less than 0.5 it has to be greater than 0.5 and your ea ratio can't be less than 0.8 it's going to be around that so in them la volume plays a bigger role so if the la volume is increased so then you're making 3 out of the 2 um 2 uh, out of the 3 positive uh, four, um, and 3 out of the 4 positive so you have increased la feeling pressure if the la volume is totally normal then e prime alone is increased then it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that you have a increased la pressure in those patients you can do can put them on exercise ask them to walk around and in my climb up say case and come back quickly increase the heart rate little bit and do it and if the e instead of 0.5 now it becomes 
um, one, like increasing, um, uh, and E prime remains exactly the same, E ratio increases, then you know that they have increased LA, LA pressure. Okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. And uh, how do you assess LV diastolic dysfunction in AF patients? Well, I think you can assess. See, nowadays the machines are coming up where simultaneously you can get the tissue Doppler as well as the E velocity and E ratio can be obtained. And there, the ideal would be is the longer RR interval beats you can take and that E prime ratio will give and then the E wave morphology on that will also allow you to look at that. Yes, it is difficult when the heart rate is fast. When the heart rate is slow, it's not very difficult at all. Most of the patients, so you you treat them with the beta, whatever medication you use, and try to regularize the heart rate heart rate to a, a reasonable level. So RR interval doesn't vary from 80 to 110 like that. So then you can measure it. If the RR interval is variable quite a bit, then it's very difficult. Unless otherwise you have a system where you can do both at the same time. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Dr. Prashant Gunasekaran. How do we assess LV diastolic dysfunction if the patient has Danis mitral annular calcification or post-valve replacement cases wherein annual, annular tissue Doppler velocities cannot be used? I, I totally agree with you. So this is one of the conundrums where you do have an issue with the mitral uh, the annular calcification. So in those cases, annular velocity may not be reliable at all, totally. I totally agree with you. There, I do depend primarily you looking at the mitral flow characteristics and also isovolumic relaxation time as well as the pulmonary vein Doppler, pulmonary vein Doppler, systolic dominant or diastolic dominant, what is the A wave duration, I use that. And same, IVRT can also be used in patients with AF also. The key important thing in those patients that is the LV function normal or abnormal? Then is the prosthetic valve velocities, are they normal or abnormal? Okay. Once the prosthetic velocities are normal, then you are going to question the symptoms, whether it's due to diastolic dysfunction or not. Before you jump into diastolic dysfunction, make sure that the, there is no patient prosthesis mismatch, which can inherently occur, and that we need to make sure the effective orifice area are projected and what is what, and the ratio you need to get. If, so if that is normal, then you can use the pulmonary vein, TR velocity, and left atrial volume as a surrogate marker to see whether the patient's symptoms are due to um, the elevated filling pressure. So here also another situation where you can use the exercise. If you're doing exercise, mitral flow velocities and the, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the E velocity and the deceleration time, that should, with the increasing heart rate, your diastolic filling period is going to be lower. So E velocity should be going up. In a patient with the prosthesis, there can be a there can be a problem. But if on the other hand, if the jump is very high quickly rather than normally, so then I think you think that there may be something something to do with the patient prosthesis. So you can look into that. But ideally speaking, in, in those patients, it is difficult. You can use you need to use more than one parameter can't help you. You have to look at several things. You have to look at the LA volume, you have to look at the LV function, you have to look at the other characteristics. I mean, it is a, it is a real problem. I do agree with you. It is a real problem. And I think one, one suggestion I would make is that in those patients, make sure that there is no subtle patient processes mismatch. So if there was a way that you can get the pre-discharge after the valve is done, pre-discharge echo was there and the values are there, trying to compare with them and well, what was their LV function at that time. So all those things play a bigger role. I do agree, it is not an easy answer. Next question. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, almost you're uh, talking for the last one and a half hours. Uh, for the interest of time, uh, 
uh, we'll take some couple of questions and shall we close it? Sure, sure. Any, anything, yes, uh, whatever it is, uh, Ashok, no problem. Yes, sir. So about uh, what heart rate we can expect incorrect assessment of diastolic dysfunctions? I think um, it varies. The reason I'm saying it is varies is, as I pointed out to you, that heart rate of 60 with you have a prolonged QT and your TP is shortened. So you're going to look like uh, grade one, E and A are superimposed. On the other hand, heart rate of 100, your QT is quite normal. So you're going to have a normal E and A. So what I would suggest is that, first of all, you, you need to look at the, that's the reason ECG becomes very important for all of you, the son of my echoes who are doing it. You need to look at it, not only just having the ECG for the sake of ECG, all the wave morphology should be perfect. You, can, you should be able to see the P wave, you should be able to see the MQRS and T wave, you should be able to do that. And when you see that, then you will realize, so if the QT interval, normally the rule of thumb is, uh, the QT interval can't be more than uh, half of RR interval. If that is the case, then it indicates that whatever you're going to do, the diastole is foreshortened by prolonged QT, that's going to interfere. So the heart rate in general, in a normal person without that problem, anyway from 60 to uh, the, the 100, 110 you can do. In the younger people, even 100, 110, no, 20 also you can do. In the older people, um, uh, about 60 to 90, you should be able to get the diastolic function right if they are in China to them. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, one last question. How to calculate uh, pressure in atria when neonat having uh, fossa ovalis? Well, I think the fossa ovalis gives you, is in, a, in a neonate, is it, it's going to be more easy because fossa ovalis, what does it do? It directs the blood from the right to left, right? But on the other hand, if it writes a direction from the left to right, like a hypoplastic left heart syndrome or something like that, then you already know. The left side is the problem. So you can get the Doppler across the fossa. That, is, that can be done even for adults. Patients who have got a heart failure, you have a PF4, take the gradient. PF4 gradient plus the IVC will give you the um, uh, left atrial pressure. And when you treat the patient, and if the PF4 gradient comes down, then you know that you've made a big, big impact. So the same way uh, in, a, in a neonate, you should be able to look at the um, uh, the flow direction and the velocity. By and large, in a normal neonate, they should be left to right, uh, uh, right to left shunt through the PFO. So, how to measure diastolic dysfunction in moderate to severe MS, MR? Moderate to severe MR, it does pose a problem. So, your E velocity is going to be high. So, it does. From pose a problem in assessing the assessing the LV you know, diastolic function, but it should not change anything with your E prime. E prime is always you know, going to tell you the relaxation property of the ventricle. So if the E velocity is quite normal and E prime is low abnormal and combine E E prime medial and lateral are abnormal, then you know that there's a um, myopathic cause is going on. So these are the cases where valvular heart disease and assessment of diastolic function, both in MS and MR, uh, are a little bit more data we need to, the, so the simplified version of what we talk about, E prime ratio and all these things may not totally do justice. It is more than that. I think uh, that requires a comprehensive assessment involving a lot of other things. So I really don't think that uh, by saying that, well, you can use this and all, I'll be giving you a false sense of um, hope that it is fine. I don't think that that, that easy. I hope the audio was <laughs> Yes, sir, it was audio. absolutely perfect. <laughs> Very good. Then. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. I'll see you. I'll talk to you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks sir. sir.